are tuned in to Radio Gold. Welcome to Radio Gold. I am Randall Emerson, and I will be your host as we continue the exploration of our vast and varied archives of classical radio programs for your entertainment. This production of The Avengers burst in the door of spy and superhero adventure drama on South African radio in 1971, starring Donald Manat as John Steed and Diane Appleby as the wonderful Emma Peel. It was based on the fine TV series, which was very popular from the start in the UK, and is an excellent example of radio's adaptation of the television medium. Part pop art, part superhero, and part adventure serial, this radio show had all of the excitement and intelligence of the original television hit. National TV wasn't available in South Africa until 1976, so radio was the only way the Avengers was popularized there, rising to almost cult status. It was produced as usually six serial episodes per week, and the cliffhanging segments keep the action moving and always leading up to a thrill to be continued. The quality of production sounds great, and the South African commercials from these original broadcast recordings are almost as interesting and intriguing as the script. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Radio Gold is proud to present The Avengers. Now, from the makers of Cold Water Omo, in the clear night sky, the planet Venus glowed warmly. The observatory was hot. Ernest Cosgrove, seated in his shirt sleeves before the large telescope, paused in his work to wipe his brow with a clean handkerchief. In his early twenties, with a mop of black hair falling into his eyes, he had an expression of keen concentration on his lean face. He made a couple of notes on a pad and chewed reflectively on a half-finished beef sandwich. Returning to his work, he adjusted the focus of the camera attachment and pressed the button. Hmm, that should do it. Whew, it's hot. On the tray, next to the plate with the sandwich, was a glass of beer, two-thirds full. A heavy froth clung to the sides of the glass. The bubbles in the beer kept rising. Cosgrove, intent upon his work, hardly noticed the strange noise that began to fill the room. He reached out for the beer glass, touched it, and reacted with a sharp cry of pain. The liquid in the glass was boiling. The reverberating sound became louder. Cosgrove stared at the glass incredulously. There was a sudden sharp explosion. <laughs> Cosgrove was knocked from his chair. He lay sprawled in a crumpled heap under the telescope. His black hair had quite suddenly turned snowy white. The Avengers. John Steed and Emma Thiel, The Avengers. Many housewives have discovered that the cleaning power of cold water Omo gives them sparkling clean results. Mrs. Joyce Whelan of East London has this to say. Now try it. Mm -hmm. And it works beautifully. I tried it on my children's clothes, on the general wash, and I noticed straight away that things were cleaner. Mm -hmm. Since then, I, I will have used nothing else but cold water Omo. Once an Omo user, always an Omo user. Omo cleans best. 
Wall's Ice Cream presents the new Pink Pussycat song. We've got strawberry and vanilla, half and half. That's on inside. Episode one of this story, in which John Steed and Emma Peel start seeing stars and find that some amateur astronomers are getting invitations from Venus with love. John Steed and Emma Peel were celebrating, celebrating having nothing at all to do. It was a very welcome change, and one that they both knew wouldn't last all that long. They would dined in the country, and returning to town on this very hot night, they'd found a pleasant spot on a roof garden restaurant for a final nightcap. Splendid night, Steve. Starry, Mrs. Beale, starry. I was, uh, meaning the evening's entertainment. Well, you, Mrs. Beale, starry. Thank you. Another glass of wine? Oh, I don't think so, thank you. Just how long will this last? Usually until morning. Trouble's bound to crop up sooner or later. It always does. I'd prefer it to be later. Oh, look, a shooting star. See it? They always seem to get away from me. Sure it wasn't imagination? No. It was a meteorite, all right. Well, life is filled with unidentified objects. Uh, Mr. Steve. And you're not one of them, Steve. Telephone call for you, Mr. Steve. How the devil could anyone know that I'm here? Well, they must know your horns. You'd better take it. It doesn't have to be trouble. But of course it was. It was Mother. And a request that Steed stopped stargazing with Mrs. Peel and hurry over to Cosgrove's observatory. Nothing had been touched except that the body of Ernest Cosgrove had been delicately covered with a sheet. Steed turned the corner back with the end of his umbrella. Hmm. That's young Cosgrove, all right. Did he trip or was he pushed? Neither, it seems. Not a mark on him. Was he important? Up and coming, according to Mother. Worked in the war ministry. One of the brighter young lads. Young? With snow white hair? He looks about... About 60. Not, though. Half that age. Any idea what he was working on? Stargazing in general. And from these notes, observing Venus in particular. Seems to have been photographing the planet. Here, look. Hmm. They're fogged. Yeah, so am I at the moment. A young man in the war ministry takes up astronomy. Dies with no apparent signs of violence, and his hair goes white. Now, what's this? Venus, our sister planet. And written inside Sir Frederick Hadley. Well, I suppose he'd better be our next step. Very curious death, Steve, as you say. Is there anyone like this? So far, Mrs. Peel. So far. It didn't take long to trace the home of Sir Frederick Hadley. He wasn't in bed. In fact, he was sitting in his study. A room that reflected a man of means. A mass of books, charts and diagrams covered the floor and the walls. From the open window poked the head of a telescope. Sir Frederick accepted the telephone call from Steed, assured him that he would be available for an interview at any time, and returned to his work. He focused the telescope on Venus and pressed the button marked automatic. The camera started clicking. Sir Frederick hummed softly to himself and poured out a whiskey and soda. <laughs> At that moment, John Steed and Emma Peel arrived. Sir Frederick reached out a hand and released the door catch, saying into the speaker, Come in. Find your own way up. Not bothering to get to his feet, he reached out for his whiskey. The glass was burning hot, the liquid boiling. He let it go with a yell. Ah! The room seemed suddenly filled with noise. Ah! 
just too late, Steve. Too late, Mrs. Peel. Dead? At least we know the exact time. A matter of seconds ago, we both heard his voice telling us to come in. I also heard something else. Curious sort of whining noise. Unusual sound. Almost like something from outer space. Has Sir Frederick always had white hair? Can't say. Manner of death is identical to Cosgrove's. We know there must have been a connection between them. They're both keen astronomers. Mrs. Peel moved over to the telescope and peered through it. Both had their eyes on Venus, too. Both filming at the same time, the time of death. I think we might take that roll of film and have it developed. Hmm. You think it might show some bug-eyed monster in a flying saucer? Well, whatever he was looking at shouldn't have frightened him to death. From the little I know of Hadley, he was a remarkably tough business tycoon. Steed and Mrs. Peel made a thorough search of the study. He seems to have strange pen friends. Oh? This letter. Dear Freddy, had a message from Venus. Next meeting, Friday the 13th. Ominous? Is it signed? Yes, Bert. And a card. Bert Smith Chimney Sweep. 24 hour service, anytime, anywhere. 11 Hembridge Road, London. Anytime, anywhere. Well, that gives you a nice task in the morning, doesn't it, Mrs. Peel? Mm. I'll tidy up in here and get the films developed. You find out where Mr. Smith is sweeping and what he knows about that message from Venus. There's got to be a connection somewhere along the line. Mrs. Peel found that Bert Smith was working at a house in the country. A large house with many large chimneys. The owner was out, wisely leaving everything covered with dust sheets. Mr. Smith turned out to be a happy chimney sweep. Mr. Smith! Hello there! Mr. Smith! Hello there! Mr. Smith's begrimed face appeared from under a plastic sheet which covered the open grate. Anyone call? He made a full entrance into the room with a cloud of soot. <laughs> oh, good morning. I was looking for Bert Smith. Oh, then look no further, dear lady, for I am he. Mr. Smith doffed a filthy old cap with an elegant flourish. I don't believe I've had the pleasure. Peel, Mrs. Emma Peel. How do you do? Mr. Smith extended a grimy hand, then withdrew it apologetically. Oh, pardon me, ma'am. And wiped it with a brush from his pocket. They shook hands. You appear to be somewhat startled. I am rather Frankly, when I read your card, I didn't expect Ah, uh, gentlemen. <laughs> the name that fooled you, Bert Smith? <laughs> well, actually, see, Bertram Fortescue Winthrop Smythe, to be absolutely correct. I had to change it, of course. Of course. Oh, firstly, it was far too long to print on the card. It just didn't go on. And more important, such a name is a, a terrible disadvantage in this business. Oh. Of course. I, who ever heard of anyone having their chimney swept by a Fortescue Winthrop smile? Oh, indeed. It's sheer prejudice, Mrs. Beale. They'll have me in for cocktails, but if I ever go near their chimneys... You're out? Ostracized. Social death. Quite. Terribly unfair, too. After all, sweeping chimneys is all I'm fitted for. It's the only thing I know. Fact. Family tradition. Man and boy, we've been chasing up chimneys since we were in the Conqueror. Sir Matthew Forskew Winthrop Smythe was actually knighted for services rendered to Queen Anne's flu. But, dally on, <laughs> dear lady, how ill-mannered of me. I, I didn't ask your business here. Is it a maladjusted smokestack? I hope not. A bothersome burner, perhaps? Actually, it's Sir Frederick Hadley. Old Freddie Hadders, ah. <laughs> You're a friend of his. I've met him in more of a professional capacity. Professional? Ah, oh, then you must be interested in astronomy. How perfectly marvellous. Then we are in sympathy. We are? I mean, we are. Well, naturally. Astronomy is my second love. After chimneys, of course. But the two things go hand in hand, really. After all, in my position, sweeping chimneys, the thing I see most of is the sky. Glinting away at the top of a brick stack, a long flue or a triple stack... Tiny patch of sky up there. What's more natural than that I should become interested in astronomy? Oh, it had to happen. Are you going to become a member of the BVS? BVS? We all are, you know, all the enthusiasts. 
Oh, reminds me, I'll probably be on watching duty tonight. Watching what? Venus, of course. Uh, for the BVS. The British Venusian Society. Oh, dear lady, I insist that you join. And it'll change your whole life. You'll never be the same again. Careful, Mrs. Peel. You could end up with white hair, too. Mary, you're lucky to have such a hard-working servant. <laughs> what do you mean? I haven't got a maid. Well, how on earth do you manage to keep your floors so clean and shiny? Ah, that's easy. I use Dual. Dual? Yes, Dual, the self-shining floor cleaner. It's so easy because Dual cleans and polishes in one go. How do you mean? Well, Dual lifts all the dirt out of the floor and dries to a bright, long-lasting shine all by itself. So when you use Dual, you don't have to worry about polishing. No, Dual cleans and polishes in one go. Once an Omo user, always an Omo user. So many housewives, like Mrs. Adnall, say. I wash every single thing in cold water ammo. Anything that's washable come out. Spotlessly clean. Yes, Omo cleans best. The Avengers. Listen every evening, Monday to Friday, to John Steed and Emma Peel, The Avengers. Brought to you by the makers of Cold Water Omo. Let's take a short intermission. The best of Dimension X from Radio Gold. Dimension X was the first sci-fi anthology series to utilize published stories from established science fiction authors, which gave the series an instant status of credibility to hardcore fans. Stay tuned. Episode 2 starts in just a few seconds. Now, from the makers of Cold Water Omo... John Steed. Ah, Steed. Found you at home. Good. Morning, Mrs. Beale. And what are you up to this bright morning? Learning all about how to sweep chimneys. Useful hobby. My teacher is Bert Smith. He's a member of the British Venusian Society. The, the what? The British Venusian Society. Gosgrove and Hadley were both members. Bert Smith says I've got to join. Members do some sort of nightly watch. Ah. How about the film from Sir Frederick's telescope camera? Been developing them. They are going to make most peculiar prints. The negative looks like a fireball charging in from outer space. Well, can't you enlarge it up and see? Mrs. Peel? Mrs. Peel, what is it? What is it, Mrs. Peel? The Avengers. John Steed and Emma Peel, The Avengers.
So many women say, once an OMO user, always an OMO user. Because there's just no dirt that can stand up to the cleaning power of cold water OMO. It solves Mrs. Sutherland's washing problems for her. Very dirty oil or grease marks. Yes. If you use cold water OMO, there's no trouble at all. It comes out very, very easily indeed. There's no washing problem too difficult for cold water OMO. Over one million South African housewives have proved it. Keep your complexion soft and young looking with the creamy, moisturizing lather of Lux. Like Claudia Cardinale, choose Lux. Lux, a beauty treatment as you bathe. <laughs> Episode 2 of this story, in which Emma Peel goes off on a wild goose chase, and John Steed gets an offer. From Venus with Love. John Steed and Emma Peel had investigated the curious death of Ernest Cosgrove, a young man who was also interested in astronomy. Cosgrove had been found dead in his observatory, lying under the telescope, with his hair turned snow white. Later, Steed and Mrs. Peel had arrived at the home of Sir Frederick Hadley, just too late to prevent him dying in an identical fashion. The next morning, Mrs. Peel followed up on a clue that led her to Mr. Bertram Fortescue Winthrop Smythe, otherwise known as Bert Smith, chimney sweep. She was telephoning Steed from the hallway of the country house where Bert Smith was working on the chimneys when she heard a strange sound from the other room. Mrs. Peel? Mrs. Peel, what is it? I don't know, Steed. Some sort of terrible noise. Like that outer space stuff we heard. Ah! Hold on. Mrs. Peel threw down the telephone and ran into the room where Bert Smith was sweeping the chimney. He wasn't. He was lying in the open grate among the dust sheets, his brushes and poles scattered over the room. He was dead, all right. And from under the rim of his cloth cap appeared a wisp of white hair. The soot which had fallen from the chimney covered his body like snow. Mrs. Peel gazed down at him in utter bewilderment. Then she heard it, the strange sound that seemed to be coming from the sky outside. Mrs. Peel ran to the window. There, at the entrance to the driveway, was a bright light moving away. Get after it, Mrs. Peel. Out on the open road, Mrs. Peel was able to put on some speed. There was no traffic about, luckily, and the car responded like a rocket. The bright object ahead seemed partly obscured in the dust. Mrs. Peel swung after it down a lane. A blinding light reflected back onto Mrs. Peel's windscreen. It glared straight into her eyes, dazzling, searing. She couldn't see. It was as though she was driving into an enormous ball of fire. She couldn't control the car. Some minutes later... Mrs. Peel, hands shielding her eyes, crawled out of her car. She gazed across the fields. There, in the next meadow, a man appeared to be on fire. It was a scarecrow ablaze. Of the strange object, there was no sign. In the inner office of the British Venusian Society, a slim, neat young man walked swiftly over to a large modern desk and addressed the person sitting behind it. Venus, the man called Steed, has arrived. Does he look prosperous? Extremely. And show him in, Crawford. Show him in. A few minutes later... This way, Mr. Steed. Oh, thank you. Steed followed the young man and stopped at the desk. He found himself looking at a stunning young woman in her late twenties. She was blonde, but far from dumb. 
She was engrossed in a mass of documents, adding up columns of figures with the concentration of a high-powered business executive. She looked up and said briskly, I'm Venus Brown, Brown with an E. John Steed, with two E's. I'm the company's secretary. Uh, find a comfortable seat. I uh, found one. Steed perched himself on the edge of her desk. I gather, Mr. Steed, that you wish to... Apply for membership. Yes, I'm afraid we're a very small select group. Oh, good, I do abhor overcrowding. With stringent rules. Which I shall observe unfailingly. And a very high subscription. The sky's the limit, to coin a phrase. We are not composed of elderly eccentrics, Mr. Steed. Steed eyed Miss Brown's slim figure. I can see that. We choose our membership with great care. Indeed. To begin with, you're a keen astronomer. Dedicated. I cut my teeth on the telescope. Your occupation? Uh, oh, well, I follow in my father's footsteps. He has spent his life depositing money. I spend mine withdrawing it. An enviable pastime. I think perhaps... Uh, you're we'll... familiar with our activities, Mr. Steed. Uh, firstly, we oppose the present space program. I didn't know we had one. But we shall have. We shall. We don't want our efforts to be squandered on the moon. Our target is the planet Venus. There's evidence it could support life. We believe it does support life. For years, we've detected radio signals. From Venus? From that direction. Our members are on nightly watch for any signs of life. There's the duty roster. Hmm. Lord Mansford, Sir Frederick Hadley, Bertram Smith, Major Whitehead. Have they spotted anything of late? Flashes of white. Look at this model of Venus, Mr. Steed. Do you see the planet is shrouded in cloud? Distorted, mysterious, remote. Behind those clouds are beings, Mr. Steed. Oh, friendly ones, I hope. Come closer. Who can say? Do you like what you see, Mr. Steed? Oh, very much. Keep your mind on your work, Steed. Uh, is it uh, going to be very expensive for me? Perhaps. Launching any sort of private exploration always is. We can't hope to compete with the major powers. Our aim is a small satellite. We still need the know-how. We have it. I was trained at Jodrell Bank. Mr. Crawford here is a radio astronomer, and uh, we have a host of other... Venus is extremely persuasive. God. No, I mean, good for you. We've acquired the backing of the Cuthbert Foundation. But we shall still have to lean heavily on our members. Oh, splendid. I have very broad shoulders. Uh, want a check now? We'll gladly accept a contribution after your election, Mr. Steed. First, you must have an eye test. Eye test? One false sighting would discredit the society. <laughs> well, look here, I, I took a first at Bisley. We uh, make no exceptions, Mr. Steed. I suggest you visit our Dr. Primble at once. Well, if you say so, Miss Brown. Uh, it is Miss Brown, isn't it? Yes, Miss Brown. Oh, well, in that case, uh, yes, yes, to your Dr. Primble, at once. While Steed was enjoying his first visit to the offices of the British Venusian Society, Mrs. Peel was having a far less pleasant day. She was walking over the fields, looking for traces of the strange flying object that had nearly wrecked her car. The burning scarecrow had long since burned itself out. A group of farm buildings had now taken her interest. Was it just sunlight that appeared to be reflected back from the windows? Mrs. Peel approached a large barn. Anyone in here? A sudden glare of sunlight shot into her eyes. Ouch! Ooh. Oh, an old cracked mirror nailed to the oak beam. Bales of straw, nothing but straw. That noise yet again. What the devil is it? it it's all around me. It's coming. It's coming from above. Outside? No, it, it can't. It's burning. Something burning. The straw, the bales, they're, they're alight. Mrs. Peel made for the nearest window to raise the alarm, and there, moving down the field away from her, was the same strange space object. 
Better leave it alone this time, Mrs. Peel. You've got trouble enough. Steed, in his car, tried to raise Mrs. Peel on her car radio. After some time... Steed? Ah, Mrs. Peel, about time. Where have you been? Chasing an unidentified object. Unidentified object? Well, that's vernacular, isn't it? A ball of bright light, a thing... Uh, from outer space? Uh, from out of barn, actually. Look, you're not trapping me into any sort of opinion about it. It was just... Well, very, very strange. And like... Like nothing I've ever seen before. Hmm. What have you been up to? Ah, well, that'll be telling. Uh, I've been with Venus. Hmm? Venus Brown, with an E. She's the company secretary. She's one of these uh, unique-type Venuses. She's got arms, amongst other things. Is that a fact? What else? Oh, lots. I'm um, working on it. Well, I'll give you another fact, Steve. Our gentleman sweep is dead. Same format. Even the soot turned white. I see. Well, Bert Smith's name was one of the five names on the duty roster of the British Venusian Society. Three of the five are now dead. The other two are Lord Mansford and a Major Whitehead. You'd better get on to him before somebody else does. Try Mansford first. And um, what are you going to be doing, might I ask? Oh, me? Well, I, um, I can't do anything until I've had my eyes tested. Oh, all right. Be good. Oh, I'll be good. Good at what, though? That's the point, isn't it? And with a final heave on the spanner, Ronnie Miller finishes changing his flat tire in just 6 minutes, 32 seconds. Well done, Ronnie. You play any other sports? I wash the car once in a while. You look very fresh, Ronnie. What deodorant do you use? Shield for sportsmen, of course. Why? It works. Shield for sportsmen deodorant won't stick, sting, or stain. In aerosol or roll-on. It's made to keep sportsmen cool and dry. Think what it can do for you. No dirt can stand up to the cleaning power of cold water Omo. Mrs. Whelan had to wash greasy overalls. And I said, oh, well, I won't worry. I'll stick it into cold water Omo. And sure enough, every bit of grease is out. Once an Omo user, always an Omo user. The Avengers. Listen every evening, Monday to Friday, to John Steed and Emma Peel, The Avengers. Brought to you by the makers of Cold Water Omen. The Avengers. Donald Monat as John Steed and Diane Appleby as Emma Peel is adapted and directed by Dennis Falbig and produced by David Gooden. Let's take a short intermission. Nero Wolfe made his larger-than-life radio show debut on July 5, 1943. This intelligent detective show, based on the Rex Stout novels, proved to be a natural for classic radio. Throughout the show's run, Santos Otega, Louis Van Ruten, Francis X. Bushman, and Sidney Greenstreet all filled the voluminous chair of Nero Wolfe. As well, a large assortment of actors played the part of every blonde's hero, Archie Goodwin. The Adventures of Nero Wolf show remained popular on the airwaves in different versions for eight years, from 1943 to 1951. Stay tuned for Episode 3 of The Avengers.
Now, from the makers of Cold Water Omo, Venus Brown rose languidly from behind her desk and, walking to the mirror, rearranged her hair. It was blonde and fell to her shoulders. She admired it, as she admired practically everything else about herself. Crawford watched impatiently. I think we are not being careful enough. I can't agree. One has to take a certain amount of chance in life. We need more money. You're... You're quite taken with this man, John Steed, do aren't you? He is agreeable and rich. I still think we should have him very carefully screened. And if he finds out we're checking on him, becomes annoyed and withdraws his support. Oh, well, that's all right with me. We did well enough without him, at least I did. <laughs> well, my dear Crawford, I do believe you are jealous. Silly boy. But I suppose it's only to be expected. All right, check on Steed if you must. But keep me informed. No matter what happens, I can handle him. Just watch me. The Avengers. John Steed and Emma Peel, The Avengers. stand up to the cleaning power of cold water Omo. Over one million South African housewives have proved it. And Mrs. Bodington is one of them. My wash is beautiful. Mm-hmm. And I'm very proud of it. My husband particularly wears a lot of white plain bowls and his clothing always looks delightful. There's nothing like cold water Omo. Yes, once an Omo user, always an Omo user. Cold water Omo is the washing powder that cleans best. Don't just admire your little girl's complexion. Share it. Knight's Castile is doubly enriched with lanolin to keep your skin soft and young. Pure, mild Knight's Castile for a complexion that never grows up. Episode 3 of this story, in which Emma Peel gets absolutely nowhere. But John Steed passes all tests with flying colors and gets a membership card from Venus with love. John Steed had very much enjoyed his visit to the British Venusian Society. The main reason for his enjoyment were the undoubted charms of the secretary, Venus Brown. Miss Brown was a dish, and Steed privately thought that if he could keep Mrs. Peel on the outside investigations, the inside work should be as agreeable as any he'd had for a long time. It was because he insisted on becoming a full member of the society that Venus had recommended he had his eyes tested. It seemed that all would-be astronomers were subjected to this, he didn't mind. He dropped in at Dr. Henry Primble's surgery later that morning, tapping gently on the frosted glass panel with the tip of his umbrella. No reply. Steed tried the door, which was unlocked, and entered. The surgery was filled with a conglomeration of bizarre equipment, including examination chairs, an operating table, plus an array of tall test cards on wheels. Steed stepped forward, but an urgent voice stopped him. No, 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 stay where you are, don't move. Steed halted. He looked to the left, to the right, up at the ceiling, and then eventually down on the floor. A head appeared from behind the ophthalmic chair, a large dome head. The gentleman in question was wearing a binocular loop, the lenses like elongated antennae. 
Steed thought he looked like something from outer space. Another unidentified object. But he risked the question. Dr. Primble, I presume? Uh, you presume right. Uh, kindly do not move your feet. Uh, what do we seem to have lost? Uh, contact lens down here somewhere. Ah, would, uh, would that be it? Steed hmm? extended the tip of his umbrella and pointed to a position about an inch away from Primble's rather large nose. Ah, ah, yes, yes, that's it. Oh, oh much obliged to you, sir. Ah, yes, that's better. Yeah. Now, my glasses. Oh, I had them somewhere. Steed mm. reached out and withdrew Primble's glasses from his white coat pocket and handed them to him. Ah, yes, again. Oh, much obliged to you, Mr... Um, Steed. Uh, Steed. Steed, Steed. Oh, I've never heard of any Steeds in the business. Uh, I'm not in the business. Ah, I see. A patient. Have you an appointment? No. Uh, then I can't see you. Never see anyone without an appointment. Well, can I make one? Certainly, certainly you can. Uh, when? Steed looked at the wall calendar. It said Friday the 13th. And then at his watch, it said a quarter to 12. How about uh, Friday the 13th at um, 11.45? Yes, yeah, suits me nicely, Mr. Steed. Take a seat. <laughs> Mrs. Peel, determined not to spend another day chasing things that looked as though they came from outer space, made for Lord Mansford's residence. Lord Mansford was issuing orders to his man, Jennings. I shall not wish to be disturbed, Jennings. Very good, sir. I intend spending the rest of the morning with my art treasures. An agreeable way of spending an hour. You will uh, see everything behind me. Of course, sir. Yes. Thank you, Thank you. Lord Mansford, a heavily built man in his early 60s, smoothed down his red hair, brushed the mutton chop styled moustache back with a freckled hand, and made for a large vault. Um, set the release for one o'clock. If you let me out at one, I understand? One o'clock, sir. Lunch at a quarter past. I shall set the alarms. Well, so when Mrs. Peel arrived, she was told... I am very sorry, Mrs. Peel. Afraid you've just missed Lord Mansford. Oh, too bad. When will he be back? Oh, he isn't out. Oh, but I thought you said... He's in. Very much in. He's in his vault, you see. Through that vault door, it leads to another wing. He's perusing his art treasures. In a vault? Security. There's a time lock. No one gets in, and he can't get out until the clock strikes one. Oh, got just about an hour. If Madame would care to wait. I was in the process of mixing an ice-cold, non-alcoholic punch... You'll be very welcome. Then, perhaps, luncheon with Lord Mansford. That sounds extremely civilized. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Steve, over to you. I'm putting my feet up for an hour. I sincerely hope you're not doing the same. But he was. In Primble's surgery. Feet up a little higher, please, Mr. Steed. Is it really necessary to lie prone in order to have one's eyes tested? Ah, uh, better lighting. Now, read the test card from the top. Identify all the hats from the top, please. Uh, Trilby, Homburg, Bowler, Jockey Cap, Pork Pie, Topper, Boater, Busby, Fed. Oh, bravo. Excellent. Mm. Well, that's what I told Miss Brown. Uh, may I get up? Uh, into the chair, please. Feet up. <sighs> Thank heavens I don't wear glasses. Now, let's see. Primble shot out a foot. The ophthalmic chair tilted back with a jerk. Primble peered down into Steed's face, directing a pen torch towards Steed's eyes. Yes, now, let's see. Uh, mm, yes, yes. Mm, mm. So, you hope to join us, Mr. Steed. Can't wait. Uh, look up to the left. Yes. Now the right. I can actually cross them, if that'll help. No, no, no. Have you seen Miss Brown's new book, 
Venus, our sister planet. Got a copy on order. Uh, it's become the handbook for the society. <laughs> Though, to be honest, I, I find it a trifle disturbing. Oh, in what way? Well, if there is life on Venus, it's not the life as we know it is. Um, at a rough guess, no. Oh, it's hot up there, you know. Very hot. It's quite hot down here at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it's too hot for humans. Of course, life can exist in many forms. Solid liquid or gas. I plump for gas myself, yes. Fiery gas. Interesting. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, Mr. Steed, your eyes are perfect. Well, I knew they were. Ah, welcome to the fold. Oh, and here's a copy of Miss Brown's little book. Oh, oh thank <laughs> you. Thank you very yes. much. Uh, there on the cover is her impression of a Venusian. Oh, how very extraordinary. Steed gazed at the photographic cover of the book and then drew from his pocket several bromide prints. How strange. They're almost identical. Good gracious. Mr. Steed, where, where did you get these? Taken with an astro camera last night. Oh, good gracious. Oh, this could be catastrophic. Why? What's oh, the matter? I, I warned them. I warned Venus and Crawford. Uh, I warned them all. Warned them? What about? Oh, this satellite to Venus. If you plan to invade a strange world, they might follow suit and, and invade us. Looking at these photographs... Perhaps they already have. The News in Society. Venus Brown speaking. Uh, Dr. Primble here. Hello, Venus. I I'm phoned to tell you that John Steed is perfectly okay. Thank you, Doctor. There you are, Crawford. I knew he was okay. His eyesight might be. There was obviously nothing wrong with the way he was looking at you. Uh, uh, I, I gave him a copy of your book. But he already has photographs taken with an astro camera. Shots of the planet Venus. But where did he get them from? Uh, I don't know. Said they were taken last night. I thought you should know. Yes. Yes, thank you, Doctor. We'll be in touch. Goodbye. What is it now? More interference? I don't know. But perhaps you could be right about Steed after all. Mrs. Peel, relaxing at Lord Mansford's home, sipped her cold punch with great appreciation. Hmm. Splendid punch, Jenkins. Thank you, ma'am. I'm glad it is to your liking. Lord Mansford will not be long. It's nearly one o'clock. The vault is fully automatic and infallible. Mrs. Peel placed the glass down on a table near the vault wall. She was surprised to see that the small glass swizzle stick was tinkling against the rim. The tinkling grew louder, and then Mrs. Peel became aware of another sound coming from within the vault. Jenkins also heard the noise. He looked at the clock on the vault door. A couple of minutes to go. Inside the vault, Lord Mansford clapped his hands over his ears. The whole house seemed filled with the screaming sound. Then everything happened at once. There was a blinding flash. The vault clock rang and the door slid open. Jenkins and Mrs. Peel rushed into the vault. <laughs> this way, Mrs. Peel. There... He must be... There he is. In the corner. That can't be Lord Mansford. He, he's changed. But it was Lord Mansford. His face was rigid, lifeless. His hair and mutton-chop moustache vividly white. And with a vicious uppercut, Jimmy Anderson finishes trimming his whole hedge in just three hours, 11 minutes. Great work, Jimmy. you play any other sport? Yes, dominoes. You're looking pretty cool, Jimmy. What deodorant do you use? Shield for sportsmen, of course. Why? It works. Shield for sportsmen deodorant won't stick, sting, or stain. In aerosol or roll-on, it's made to keep sportsmen cool and dry. Think what it can do for you. 
There's just no dirt that can stand up to the cleaning power of cold water Omo. Mrs. Gray of Durban has this to say. Uh, I couldn't even explain it. it. It astounded me. I was really and truly very astounded. Once an Omo user, always an Omo user. The Avengers. Listen every evening, Monday to Friday, to John Steed and Emma Peel, The Avengers. Brought to you by the makers of Coldwater Omo. Now get on over to the Radio Gold channel and find the exciting three-part conclusion to this adventure. Radio Gold is a three-nines-fine radio production. See you next time.